Take your Bible, if you would. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It's good to have everybody here with us this morning. Good to have some visitors, and we want you to feel at home, feel welcome. If anybody gives you the evil eye or the crook eye, you come tell me and I'll pop them. No, I won't do that. I'll get somebody bigger than me to do it. I'll get, I'll get like, uh, what's your name again? Kyle, yeah. No, it's your name. It's your name. I'm not kidding you. Your parents gave you that name. I don't know why. Um, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. No, we want you to feel at home, feel welcome. And uh, if God brings you back by this place again, then we want the same thing for you. The book of Ecclesiastes. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon did. If, you want to, if you're ever in a good mood and want to be in a bad one, read Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Um, Solomon was the man. God gave him wisdom, for sure. The wisest man, the Bible says, that ever, that ever lived, aside from Jesus, of course. And the book of Ecclesiastes basically goes like this. God gave Solomon wisdom, and he, would, he was king for 40 years. During that 40-year time, God let him retain all of his wisdom. And he writes Ecclesiastes at the end of his life. And he says this, he says, I had everything that any man or any woman could ever want. I had women. We know the Bible says he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That was just sleep partners. He'd snap his finger, clap his hands or do whatever and have one in bed with him. God allowed that. He said, I had wine. And he said, I had people playing music all the time around me. He said, I had chariots. I guess the 21... 21st century version of that is cars. Probably had, probably had a dozen Teslas. A bunch of sports cars and stuff like that. He had servants. He had money. He had uh, nations around him because of his father, David. They, they knew David was a fierce warrior. And if you were going to go to battle against Israel, you were, you were basically wasting your time and you were going to get yourself killed. And so because of uh, Solomon's father, David, the nations surrounding Israel, in fact, around the known world at that time, uh, came and brought presents to King Solomon as a peace offering saying, hey, we're not going to mess with you. We know that, there, we know that you have a God that is more powerful than ours and we're not going to mess with you. So Solomon had... He had gifts coming to him. He had, he had, I think the Bible said he had apes. Am I right on that? He, he, had, he had monkeys. And uh, I mean, he had it all. And at the end of his life, he said, God, let me retain my wisdom. He said, I'm looking at my life like I'm looking at it from the outside in. Or the inside in. And he said, all of that that I had, when I die, I don't take any of it with me. Not even the apes. I take nothing with me. And he said, with everything that I had, the thing that is going to happen to me is the same thing that happens to my servants. That's the same thing that happens to the poorest man that there is who has nothing. Is that we all are going to die and our body's going to turn to corruption and we'll have to stand before God one of these days. And so he said, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. He said, I had it all. Guys and ladies, everything that you could ever want, ever lust after, ever think you, boy, I got to have this in life or I just won't be happy. Solomon had it. God let him have it to teach us that having those things does not bring happiness. Serving God does. Being on God's good side brings happiness. It brings joy. Because I know when I die, what's going to happen to me afterward. And I know that because I believe what God said in his word. And I'm convinced of it. 
I'm persuaded to believe that God is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So in Ecclesiastes, Solomon shows us a little bit of that wisdom. And I've been preaching this now for a little while. Um, and I like it. Last Sunday, I really struggled. I don't know why. I was really down last Sunday, and I just don't like being that way. But uh, it happens every now and then. That's probably one of them cycles that I was in. And uh, it would have been great if somebody else, if a friend of mine that I know is a preacher, would have walked in last Sunday and said, Brother Mike, I'd like to preach for you if you don't mind. I, I would have said, take it. Take it. Uh, but this morning I feel a little bit better and I appreciate everybody praying for me, but I want to tell you something that's part of this cycle that we go in. So he says in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse four, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose. By the way, if you are, uh, someone who is of a persuasion that you believe the earth is flat, verse 5 then is a lie. Because in the flat earth, the sun never goes down, it never comes up, it spins around in a straight line like this. That's their model, that's, that, that's their model. I didn't make this up, they made this up. And they, never, they can never show how the sun goes down and how it rises up again. And yet, I, I know there's at least a dozen or more verses in the Bible that say that exact same thing. It's almost like God knew that people would come up with something like that. Don't you believe that? Amen. The sun also arises, that the sun goes down and hastens to his place where he arose. That's a circuit. That's a cycle. And he said, the wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. That's a cycle. Then verse 7 is how God, how God showed this to me. All the rivers run into the sea. I've said this like this. All the rivers in this area, the Merrimack, the Joachim, uh, the Big River, all of those rivers, Platten Creek, all of those rivers, they run into the Mississippi. And the Mississippi runs into the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf of Mexico, the water gets warm down there and it gets picked up by the wind and the sun. In the form of humidity, that same water is brought back around in like a circle because the Gulf of Mexico is where we get our humidity out today. And it comes back around again over the Midwest and in the right circumstances, it, it turns into rain and falls back down on us again like we had rain the other night. It comes back down on us, runs right back into the Platten Creek or Joachim or whatever, Merrimack. Runs right back in the Mississippi River, goes right back down into the Gulf of Mexico. They say it takes about 90 days for water to go from Minnesota, where it starts, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. I think that's probably about right. Solomon knew that before anybody else knew it. Now, this is, this is your life. Your life will go in cycles. Not every day will you feel like you're a winner. Not every day will you feel like you're on top of the world. Those, those, those do not happen. And if you've listened to some... Bozo on television tell you that he's lying through his teeth. He's lying to you to get money out of you. He's going to teach you that you can live in constant victory. And if you don't, it's your fault. And that bad things don't have to happen to you, which means you never get sick and you never run out of money. And you always have more than what you need. And all of those lies that they tell you and people try that stuff. And then when it doesn't happen and they go broke or they get sick and they're about to die... They get mad at God over it. Well, God didn't say that. The bozos on the, on the TV said that or on the YouTube or whatever. They're the ones that said that, but God didn't say it. God teaches us that everything in our life goes in a cycle. So all the rivers, verse 7, run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Now look at verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now, if you were to ask me this morning, uh, P Pastor Mike, has Sister Sweetie Pie, your wife, Lisa, has she ever been mad at you? Yeah. Ask me if uh, she got over it. 
Yeah, a while. And then ask me, did she get mad at you all over again? Yeah. Why are you asking me these things? It goes in cycles. Everything in my life goes in cycles. Lisa and I have our good days. We have rough days. We've learned 37 years to get through them, pray through them, kind of walk away from them, and then when things are better, enjoy one another. And that happens to every relationship. In the case of someone who is already born again, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 1 now, that's what's up on the screen. We're on day 5 of creation. To a person who is saved, God is always working in your life whether you see it or not. Sometimes watching God work in our life is like us planting flowers with seeds out in our flower bed, pulling up a lawn chair, watering the seed, and then sit down and watch it spring up. How long is it going to take before you ever start to see a little seedling coming up out of the ground? Days. That's, that's like watching how God works in our lives sometimes. If you want to sit and watch, I mean, Solomon took him 40 years to figure all of this out. But God showed it to him after about 40 years of his life. God showed it to him, and now we, we can read it for ourselves. Choice is, do you got to believe it or not? And so, in our lives, we're going to have days where it looks like God is doing nothing for us, nothing with us, Nothing through us and nothing to us other than us being down in the dumps and sometimes we blame God for it. And sometimes maybe God is the one that rolled you down in the dumps so that when he pulled you out of there, he got the praise, the glory, the credit, the thanks, the amens, the hallelujahs, the praise the Lord, the buenas, the feeways, all of those things. God gets all of those things and we don't take the credit for our own success anymore. Amen. Amen. So now we went through the days of creation to show you how God works in a cycle in our life. Day one, we're, we're, we're made, but we're without form and void. And every, we don't know anything. And God just barely has, has started the work in our life. And if you're not saved, I'm showing you how God is going to save you, if God is going to save you. Some people ask God, this may be too much for today, I don't know, but God, for whatever reason, doesn't offer it. God said, I will be merciful unto who I, I will give mercy to whom I give mercy. I will forgive who I forgive. And it's up to God. But anyway, when God works in your life, day one, God creates you. God shows you the light. Day two, God divides the, 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 everything up here from everything down here to show you that you're not God. You're not involved. You're not the boss of your own life. There is something that is higher than you. And it is God. You're not God, but God is God. Day three, God planted the seed of the Word of God in your life. Somebody quoted a scripture, or you read a scripture on Facebook or TikTok or something like that, and God planted the Word of God in your life. Maybe like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was some other verse. And then day four. Now God gives us, shows us the difference in the lights. God created the sun on day four. God created the moon and the stars uh, on day four. And God gave us the greater light to rule over the day, which is the sun. The lesser light to rule over the night or the darkness. And the question that I was asking last Sunday was, would you rather live in the darkness or would you rather live in the light? Only you can make that decision. And if you are a child of the light, 
then you won't mind if God turns the light on to make you aware of things that are wrong in your life. Amen? It won't bother you at all. It won't make you mad if I preach something and you think that maybe your wife told on you. That's how I knew how to preach on it. And uh, you're, you're, now you're mad at me and you're mad at your wife and you're just upset at the whole thing and you, and you think that I'm trying to get to you. No, that was just God showing you the light. And if you want to be a child of the light, it won't bother you. We need more, hey, I, I'm one of these, I think we need more light on our government. Amen. Day five. Let me show you what God's got to do. Genesis chapter one, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. We call them fish. On day five, God created fishing. Amen? God created fishing and has ruined marriages all over the world since then. Uh, God created fish and then fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So on day five, everything that's under the water, God created. Everything that's up in the sky, God created. Those two things. And he says in verse 21, and God created great whales. And every living creature. Now, I am, I'm going to ask the question, why did God bring up whales in this verse? I mean, we already know that they are in the water. So we would just assume, and assume correctly, that God would have created them on day five because they are in the water. And God created everything in the water on day five. Why did he go out of his way to mention whales? Is there a story in the Bible? I didn't ask for you to say something. Now you ruined my whole message. I'm going home now. It, there is a story in the Bible that has a whale in it. And I promise you, it has everything to do with why it's in this verse. Why God mentioned it. God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl. By the way, that's also when God created fried chicken. Thank you, God. Amen. It's in the Baptist creed that you got to eat fried chicken. Amen. Every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 22, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now I've got a note here, and I want you to remember it. I, you know I don't give you Hebrew and Greek lessons too often, but this one really has my attention. and has everything to do with what I'm going to show you today, of what day five represents. The word whales here, the Hebrew word is tanin. That's how you pronounce it. It looks like tannin, but it's pronounced tanin. Okay? Write that down. Just make a note of it in your mind. We're going to come back to this. What is a tanin, and what did God mean when he put that there in that verse? It has everything to do with what I'm going to show you. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this message. I thank you, God, for it. Thank you, God, for bringing us all into your house. We love you. Help us to love one another. Help us to love your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, uh, turn to G Genesis 5. I've got to show you everything that God has done follows an order. And as some of you know, I study the numbers in the Bible. They're there for a reason. Uh, if I were to ask you, what's the most significant number in the whole Bible, what would you say? Seven. Everybody says seven, and it is. It's probably, it's probably the most significant one in the Bible. There are seven spirits of God. Seven is the number for perfection. There are seven days in a week. The seventh day is the Sabbath day. It's the rest day. Um, the, 
the high priest was to sprinkle the blood that was on the hyssop. He was to sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant seven times. That showed it that it was complete, that their salvation was atoned for and it was done with and everything like that. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. God said in, uh, in uh, Psalm chapter 12. So everybody knows that the number seven is significant. The number six, what, what would you say about the number six? The beast, 666, Revelation chapter 13, that's there, okay, and it, and it means something. What about, what about the number five? Well, let's take a look at this. This is Genesis 5, and I want you to notice something. I notice that I have the, the word Adam underlined here. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, it was Mr. Adam and Mrs. Adam. Did you know that that's why the woman takes the last name of the husband? It goes all the way. That's first, the first marriage. That's how it was. It was Mr. and Mrs. Adam. God called their name Adam. That's why we do that. Anyway, uh, God called their name Adam in verse 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, count with me up here. This is Genesis 5. We've got five verses here, and we see Adam. One, two, three, four, five. He's mentioned five times here, and the fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. Now, we're not going to go through the whole chapter, but I've kind of highlighted the points. This is a genealogy in Genesis 5. And when Seth became the, the son of Adam, Seth is mentioned five times in, in verse 8, and he died. Same with his son Enos. All the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. That's the fifth time he was mentioned. All the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Fifth time again. Verse 17, all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and 5 years, and he died. Fifth time, his name is mentioned. Genesis 5.20, all the days of Jared were 960 and 2 years, and he died. Genesis 5.27, all the days of Methuselah, who was what? What's he known for? Oldest man in the Bible. But didn't he die too? All the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Fifth time, he's mentioned. All the days of Lamech were 770 and 7 years, and he died. Fifth time Lamech is mentioned. The only two names in the genealogy of Adam, going from Adam to Noah, the only two exclusions are Enoch and Noah. The fifth time Enoch is named is mentioned, it doesn't say he died. And right after that it says, uh, Enoch walked with God, for, and uh, was not, for God took him. We know that Enoch was translated into heaven without dying. Enoch didn't die. The fifth time his name is mentioned, it doesn't say that he died. Same thing with Noah. The fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, do you know what the Bible says? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he escaped it too. So I learned that the number five represents death. Now I'm going to show you this as a, as a way of showing it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the, let's count them, uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fifth book of the Bible. And in the last chapter of the fifth book of the Bible, in verse 5, the Bible says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Imagine that. Adam dying, mentioned five times. Fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. That's in Genesis chapter 5. His son mentioned five times, he dies. Seth, Enos, Enos dies, mentioned five times. Mahalalel, Methuselah, Lamech, Jared, they all die being mentioned five times. Romans chapter 5 tells us this. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now why did God say that? Because he's drawing your attention to Going back to look at Adam and his life and that pattern that I showed you, it's associated with death. And also Moses. Moses also, the writer of the first five books of the Bible, died in the fifth book of the Bible. And what I want to know is how Moses wrote about his own death. That's called inspiration. Amen. <laughs> Moses, write this down. You can handle it. All right. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. God did not tell you, John, or uh, you, Gary, or you, Kyle. See, I knew your name. Yeah, okay. God did not tell you not to eat from a certain tree. But God did tell you, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not bear false witness, thou shall not covet. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt have no other gods before. God did tell you those things, and you broke those commandments, did you not? Therefore, death comes to all men who transgress God's law. So what is the number five so far? What does it mean? Death. Now, we're going to apply this in the area of, number one, someone who is not saved, and number two, someone who is. Those of you who are saved, you already know the answer to this. What must happen to us before we can be born again? You got to die. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, is what Hebrews says. There cannot be two yous abiding in the same heaven. The you that did all the sins, and the new you that was born again, that goes to heaven. There cannot be two of you in heaven. One of them, you're going to have to, you're going to give up one or the other. Think about Esau. Esau was given an everlasting inheritance, wasn't he? And yet, what did Esau do with his everlasting inheritance? He traded it in for something that was temporary. Because how, how long, when you're hungry, does a bowl of beans last? With cornbread. How long are you going to stay unhungry with that? About four, five, six hours maybe. And if the beans are good, you go back and get some more. But then you're hungry again, aren't you? And that's what Esau did. He turned, he took that which was temporary, traded in that which was eternal, his inheritance. He gave it to his brother, Jacob. And Jacob ended up with the inheritance. And by the way, it's, it was Jacob's line that Jesus was born through. You see what I'm saying? Those of you who are listening to my voice right now, and you don't know whether or not you're born again or not, you don't know. You know, you can lie to yourself. Lots of people do it. Lie to themselves, tell themselves, I'm good enough to go to heaven. I believe in God. And just remember the devils also believe and tremble. Believing in God doesn't get you in heaven. Dying does. There was a man in this church, some of you remember him, um, Warren um, Bergman. He was one of the kindest men that I've ever met. And uh, he was always pastor's right-hand man. Whatever pastor we had here, Warren always attached himself to him. And wherever, if the pastor went on visitation, Warren went with him. Pastor was going to go see somebody in the hospital, Warren was with him. And he wasn't trying to suck up, he just was glad to be saved. And he just liked living for God. Well, he started having pain in his back. And he went to the doctor, and they did a bunch of scans on him. They found out he had cancer. He lived a month after that. That's all he lived was a month after he found out he had cancer. And see, I was here at the church as an assistant pastor, and I had always hoped that God would let me have Warren Bergman, if I ever became pastor here, that Warren could be my right-hand man. God said no. Okay? And so, Warren, 
I was talking to him one time. He was in bad shape. And I prayed with him and I said, Warren, I'm a little bit jealous of you. He said, why is that? I said, you're about to go see heaven. And I wish that I could go with you sometimes. And he thought for a while about that. He wasn't sure if he liked that I said that. He said, I'm still praying that God will heal me. I said, I'm telling you, he will. He just may have to get rid of the old body to do it. And that's what God did. God healed that man. Will he ever get cancer again? No. Will anybody ever have to mourn this man's death ever again? No. Because he never will die again. Amen. There's a saying, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. And ask yourself the question, is there anything in this world that I would take uh, instead of receiving eternal life in heaven? Is there anything in this world that I would hang on to other than going to heaven when I die? If the answer is, there's nothing that I want more than going to heaven, then you're on the right path, my friend. But you've got to let go. We have a story that uh, our Mima, my dad's mom, she found out she had cancer. I think she knew, just didn't tell nobody. She gets real sick, has to go in the hospital. They open her up to see how bad it is. They closed her back up. It was too bad. And she hung around in that hospital bed for I don't know how long. And finally, they took my people over there to the hospital. And he said, Dorothy, you go home now. You go home now. I'll be with you shortly. She died that afternoon. You know what I think? I think she had to let go. The day my daddy died over here, they, they kept resuscitating him. And then he'd go back out again. They'd come in, they'd do the paddles and everything like that and get his heart pumping again. And after about the fifth time, the doctor coming out saying, well, we got him back, but he's real shaky. I remember I was sitting there in the hallway, and I bowed my head, and I said, God, that's enough. I'm going to give you my dad. You can have him. That was tough. And then a few months later, I had to turn around and give God my granddaughter. That was tough. But I know where they are now. And I don't have to worry about them. In fact, the day before I preached my granddaughter's funeral, she was five weeks old, by the way, I went down in the woods and was down there talking to God. And I told God, God, you can have every one of my grandchildren as long as I know where they're going. Dying's going to happen. You're the one who gets to choose how that happens. You either die once, go to heaven, because you're born again. Or God's, you're going to stand before God, and God's going to say, Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. And be cast into everlasting punishment, the Bible says. Everlasting punishment. That's not fun. To those <clears throat> that are born again, 
There's always something in our life, isn't there, that's not right. Am I correct in that? There's always something in our life that's not right with God. Always. And so God starts working a work in our life. And it usually comes down to something that has to die. Before God can recycle everything and make it all new. And in fact, isn't that what Jesus said? Behold, I make all things new. Now, what does all things mean? Every thing. I make all things new. Our problem usually is we don't want to give up what it takes in order for God to do something brand new in our life. We don't want to give it up. But I'm here to tell you, it's got to die. That's, that comes in the form of this church used to be in a denomination, a denomination that I loved. I went to two of their Bible colleges. Uh, those men in those Bible colleges, my professors, I loved every one of them. I, I treated them well with respect and um, didn't always do my homework, but that was me. And, um, and I would have done anything for the denomination. But then God started showing me things that was not right. And that God was going to use me, but he basically was telling me in, 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 in a way that I understood, you are not going to waste what I give you on a denomination because they won't accept it. So God had to kill my old denomination and what I was attached to. God had to kill that in me before he could give me what he really wanted me to have. And I'm thankful for that because I have something that's far greater than anything that I could have ever done inside of a denomination. Far greater than that. If, if we saved one person's life last week when we did a feeding, that is far greater than anything I could have done or this church could have done in the denomination. God had to kill it for us before we would accept what God was going to replace it with. And I promise you, God's always got a replacement. You know, you know what we tell the widows here? We tell them, don't worry. We know you loved your husband. He was a good man. But we kind of think that God's better than your old husband was. And when you lean on God, you don't have to worry about when he's going to get up and do it. Amen. Amen. Now, let me show you something. I got to get back to this. Ephesians 2, 1. You have the quickened. Quickened means made alive. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Means that if you're a sinner right now, not saved, you're already dead. You're already dead. You're going to be judged. You're going to be found guilty. You're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That is God's written down promise in the word of God, book of Revelation. That is exactly what's going to happen. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation, what is that? Revelation 2015. I remember that from being in seventh grade, I think. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved. And see, you don't do anything to deserve it or earn it. It's just something that God wants to give to you. But what you don't understand and what we don't understand is we're afraid to let go of what we have now. But that's where the trusting God part comes in. Got to let go. Got to let go. I've been through it. You've been through it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's like personal issues that are related to like sins or if it's... Uh, uh, situation in a marriage or if, if it's uh, like something at work 
and uh, you see things going on at work and you, you can't be a part of it, and, uh, but you're afraid to let go because, I mean, that's your employment and everything like that. And finally God, finally, God just takes it away from you, but he gives you something way better than what you ever had before. I mean, that's just, it is, I'm telling you, it's the cyclical work of God. So then, oh, here we go now. Look at this. That's a pretty good picture of a whale, isn't it? Jonah chapter 1. In fact, turn your Bible there. I want you to turn this in your Bible. I want you to underline it. I want you to see it. I want you to see it. You used to have people say, oh, the Bible never said it was a whale. It said it was a fish. Yeah, it does say it was a whale. You just didn't read the whole Bible. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now, the, the scientists of the world, the marine biologists, they all say the same thing. There is no species of whale that has the capacity to allow a human being to survive for three days inside of its belly. Therefore, we do not believe the story of Jonah and the whale, the way the Bible puts it, we believe that is a fable or an ancient myth that was tossed into the Bible. Well, Mr. Egghead scientist, you just didn't read the thing. Look at what it says in verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So let's just say that they were right. That there really is no species of whale that could hold a man alive in his stomach for three days. But God made one. God fixed one up to where Jonah could sit in there for three days and remain alive and very lucid and then be vomited out the third day. God whether there used to be one or there wasn't one and God made one, the bottom line is the story of Jonah is still true. You see, you can't believe, you can't say you believe God, but you don't believe Jonah because science tells you Jonah cannot be true. Because Jesus himself, down in Matthew 12, 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, Jesus attached a biblical theological truth, him going down to the lower parts of the earth to preach to spirits in prison. He, he equated that with Jonah's three days in the whale's belly. And if Jonah did not actually spend three days in the whale's belly, then Jesus lied. And Jesus doesn't lie amen so Jonah 1 17 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up I want you to underline that phrase swallow up you're gonna find out why in a minute now look at chapter 2 verse 1 then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord and he heard me out of the belly of, what did he say there? Hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now look at what Jesus said. He was, as Jonah was three days, three nights in the whale's belly, and Jonah called it hell, Jesus said, so I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Same place. We're talking about the same place. Jonah had to die. He had to give himself up when he was on that boat. And the storm came up and it was about to overturn that boat. All of those guys on that boat had all their gods. They were praying to all their gods. Jonah finally had to step up and say, guys, I'm the one. You've got to get rid of me. You've got to throw me overboard. If you expect to live, you've got to get rid of me. So those guys said, okay, and they grabbed Jonah and they threw him overboard. And then they said, boy, that worked. Sometimes you've got to give up. you got to give up. Because Jonah probably laid in that boat going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. 
until finally God said, Jonah, get up. Go tell them it's you. That you've angered me. And I'll save those guys if you'll give yourself up. One of the hardest things in life, people, is to give stuff up. To give, to give people up. To give relationships up. To give jobs up. But if God means for you to have something better, you got to trust Him in that. Now, what was that word I told you to learn? Tanin. Tanin. So here is the um, Blue Letter Bible. I, I like to go there. And it gives you the strong concordance place of every word in the King James Bible. And so that word Tanin is actually translated as dragon 21 times. Whale three times. Serpent three times. The whale was in, the whale translation was in Genesis chapter 1. Where he, he said he made great whales. That word was tanin. But look at the other, look at what it means. Dragon, serpent, sea monster, dragon or dinosaur. I mean, if we believe the earth is 6,000 years old, the people who lived back then didn't know the word dinosaur. What did they call them? They call them dragons. And you see dragons all through the Bible. And if dragons are a myth, then the Bible is a lie. And the Bible's not a lie. The Bible is telling you the truth. There were dragons back in there. There was a behemoth. There was a Leviathan that God talked about to Job. He talked about the behemoth being humongous and having a tail like a cedar. And, this, and the, the, uh, the stupid theologians say, that's probably a hippopotamus. Have you ever seen a hippopotamus tail? It's about that long. And all it does is clean its bottom after it doo-doos. Wouldn't that be handy if God gave us one of those? Amen. But he wasn't describing a hippopotamus. He was describing something that had a, that had a tail as big as a cedar. And Job knew what God was talking about. So... See that picture I got there? You know what that's from? Turn to Exodus 7. Mm -mm -mm. Exodus 7. Remember, if you look there on the screen, the word tanin is used three times and it's translated as serpent. Where? Exodus 7, verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a what? You know what the Hebrew word is there? Take a guess. Tanin. We're talking about some kind of evil dragon serpent monster creature thing. Okay, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Look at verse 12. For they cast down every man his rod and they became what? Serpents, tanin. But underline this in your Bible. Aaron's rod did what to their rod? Same thing, same exact thing that the whale did with Jonah. Swallowed him up. Aaron's rod, listen to this, Aaron's rod is Christ. And it's a picture of Christ coming down to this world, taking on death to himself. And who rules over death? The serpent. The devil, Satan, the dragon, he is the ruler of, of death. He is the God of death. A 
And Christ came down and took him onto himself. And when he nailed him, when he was nailed to the cross, he nailed the one who had the power of death to his cross. That is the devil. That's why you see Aaron's rod swallowing up their rods. Because death is swallowed up in victory. He will, Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory. Now see, this is one of the reasons why I'm in favor of just using one Bible. Because you won't get this if you start looking at all the other translations. They will not say swallow up and use them in the way that I'm showing you here. I'm showing you that wherever there's death, God swallows it up in victory. Death, he shall swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up. In victory. Woo! Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? For 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, don't we? See, I'm looking at y'all's faces this morning. It would be interesting if you just took a Sunday and sat up here on stage and watched everybody. See, yeah, sometimes it is funny. I tell you that. But a lot of times I can see... The, the burdens, the groanings, the, the fight in you about you dying to something that God needs to take away from you. But we have the promise, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. That's what the serpent represented. Aaron's rod. It was Christ swallowing up death in victory. Victory was the cross, wasn't it? That's why we have one here without a dead guy on it. There's no dead guy on a cross anymore, is there? Just a cross. An empty one. And what that represents is our Savior died, but he got over it. He swallowed up death and victory. Jonah's whale is death swallowing up death in victory. So that when Jonah... Now watch this. The old Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, did he? What did the new Jonah do? He went to Nineveh. And what did God do with Nineveh? He spared them. They believed, the king himself believed what Jonah was saying. And he declared a fast and he said, if, if I catch anybody inside Nineveh not fasting, not in sackcloth, not with ashes on their head, I'm going to kill them. This is God talking. We better take him seriously or we're all going to be dead. And revival broke out. An entire Fenced, walled city got saved the day the new Jonah was born. Now you let that put doodads all up and down your back. Because that's, oh, that's, that's what I got going now. I'm telling you, letting it die is a lot better. Because then God can replace it with what he was going to replace it with. I can stand here and tell you story after story after story of how that's been done in my life. That map out there, outside the wall of the bathroom, those two maps out there are just a part of it. God had to kill off a Christian school and a daycare, and I wanted those two things more than anything. And Matthew will tell you, what we do, Matthew, the, the day we put all the kids out of the school, what would we do? We knocked all the desks down, 
fixed it all up, and painted a wall green. And I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Matthew helped me that day. That had to die in me before God could bring something better out of it. I'm just telling you that's how it works. So, just to jump ahead, what does God create on day six? A new man. That's doodads. A new man. I want you to bow your heads. What is there that you haven't given up? You know God's got to kill it. And you also know that you can't do it. You can't do it. It would be like you trying to purposely cut your own hand off. You just really can't bring yourself to do it. Sir, Ster, Sterling could not have operated on himself. So a doctor, he had to trust a doctor to do it for him. But I think it's worked out pretty good with him so far. And whatever it is, if you're, if you're listening to me right now and you are not saved, behold, today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Today is the day. Give up your whole life. Give it up. Let God have it. And watch what he turns it into. Those of you who are saved, there is always something that God is trying to deliver you from or drive out of you or kill off. What did Jesus say in John 15? My father is the husband and I'm the vine, you're the branches. My father always purges the vine to take off the unfruitful parts of our life. Because they're eating up all of the nourishment that we would get from the vine, Christ. And he takes those things and he casts them into the fire. And they never grow back again. So that God could bring forth a branch out of you that is fruitful for his kingdom. And our father is pleased when that happens. So I want you to consider the word of God that's been preached this morning. And if you need to, I'm going to ask you to come down to one of these benches down here and have a time of prayer. If God's leading you to do it, the things that God wants to drive out of your life, let him drive out of your life. You can pray right where you are. This morning as we pray, you go to God. And I almost guarantee you there's something in your mind right now that you know it don't belong there. And you ask God... God, take it away. I must die so that I can live. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this day. We ask you, Lord, for your help for these people, Lord, that have gathered here today. Lord, there's always something in my life, I know there is, always something that I need to be delivered from, that I need to walk away from, that needs to die off of me. It's always something. And God, I don't have the ability to do it. 
You have to do it for me. And Father, help us, dear God, so that our heart takes over and our heart will help us make the decision to tell you, God, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it, God. And Father, we need your help. We ask you, God, Lord, that what you take away from us, Father, we ask you, Father, to give us grace and give us something better than what we held, held on to, what we had. Father, I ask you to bless those, Lord, who call upon you and call upon your name this morning. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for coming to God's house this morning.